thousand members representing six continents and thirty-three countries. Wow. Yeah, and she, there's a, a table out there, right? With information and cards and all that stuff, so you might want to pick that up. Um, and she manages the social media sites on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and WordPress. Okay, I only even know how to get on. <laughs> Dr. Katie McGee, she's a physical therapist, uh, board certified specialty in women's health, physical therapy, um, and specializes in treating conditions during pregnancy and postpartum. And now that you know, she's here to take a lot of hearts because you know how many of our patients don't even know such a kind of physical therapy exists, right? Mm -hmm. So let's spread the word. Um, and she is working with the goal of shame and fear out of pelvic health issues, including, and I'm sure we've all heard this, pain with intercourse, incontinence, and perineal problems. <coughs> so welcome, both of you. I'm so eager to hear you. Thank you, you step out for a minute, so. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Uh, who is emotionally exhausted? <laughs> right? Yeah. We need a nap. Um, unfortunately, I have bad news for you. <laughs> this, is gonna be, this is gonna be really sad, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, so as she said, my name is Laura Fry. Uh, I am a patient advocate, and um, I'll be talking to you about just everything I've learned over the course of my own care, and then the, especially the last four years of running the support group. Uh, the objectives today are to understand um, the trauma that we go through, that most people aren't really comfortable talking about it, um, and provide resources regarding that trauma, both on the physical side and the emotional side. Sit wherever you want. <laughs> um, and so hopefully for those of you who maybe are on like the medical side of things, um, you're all on the medical side of things, sorry. On the um, maybe actual birth itself, birth workers, um, to help improve retention, because um, I'll talk to you later about a poll in our group that showed that almost 70% of us switch providers after our tears. Um, so hopefully understanding some of this stuff will help improve um, that retention. So for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with what exactly these tears mean, um, I'm just gonna try to do a brief overview for you. So there are four degrees, four being the worst. Um, a first degree tear means that just the skin is involved only. Um, that may or may not require any stitches. For a second degree tear, um, that means that the skin and the muscles and fascia of the perineum are involved, and that um, should require stitches most of the time. Uh, to help those tissues heal. This is also the degree of most episiotomies um, are to the second degree. Um, and, but what we will be focusing on is mostly the third and fourth degree tears. Uh, those are the ones that involve the anal sphincter um, themselves. So for the third degree tear, um, those here, here in the US, we call all third degree tears, third degree tears. Uh, but in countries, especially the UK, they are doing a really good job of breaking them down into the separate categories. Um, there's a 3A, 3B, and 3C. And that talks about um, how much of the anal sphincter muscles are torn. So for a 3A, that means um, there's like the external sphincter and then the internal sphincter. So a 3A means the external sphincter is torn less than 50% and the internal sphincter is completely intact. A 3B means that greater than 50% of the external sphincter is torn. Again, the internal sphincter is fine. But a 3C means that it's torn completely through the external sphincter and into the internal sphincter, whether it's completely torn or partially. Um, so you might say, well, what does it really matter? They're all third degree tears. Why do we need to break them apart? So let's say you have two moms who both have a third degree tear. One has like a um, a mild 3A tear, someone who has like a really bad 3C tear. The recovery of that could be significantly different. But when they meet each other and they talk, they both say, oh yeah, I had a third degree tear too, but they could be 
having vastly different experiences. So I think it will be awesome if we start seeing um, this broken down better in the US. Uh, so that's third degree tear. Fourth degree tear means all of that stuff is torn and then it's also torn into the rectum itself. So you're completely torn from the vagina to the rectum. Um, so as you can see, that's a lot of layers. That's a lot of things that are damaged. Um, the recovery for that, the repair for that is extensive. Um, it is a very serious injury. Um, some of us have been told by medical professionals, whether it's nurses, midwives, or doctors, um, they say that it's kind of referred to as a vaginal C-section, which I know can be kind of triggering for some people to hear, especially those who have had C-sections. Um, you know, trying to compare the two can be hard to hear, but I think there really are um, some similarities. So there's um, the idea that you maybe didn't birth your baby, that they, especially if this is, um, the fourth degree tear if it's uh, in combination with like an episiotomy and a vacuum or forceps, like they cut you and they pull the baby out of you. There are some similarities there. Um, I've been like on the verge of tears like the whole weekend. Uh -huh. I'm gonna try not cry. Um, so that is, you know, there are definitely some physical comparisons um, and then emotional ones also. So then down at the bottom you see a buttonhole tear trying to make this brief, but whew. Um, a buttonhole tear, which I've heard from a couple of people even this weekend who it sounds like they may have experienced something like this. It's rare. Um, so externally, it looks like they maybe only had a first or second degree tear, maybe even completely intact perineum. But internally, the tear goes all the way through. Um, so if it's not caught right away and repaired, they have some significant um, complications down the road, whether it's a day or two they realize it, a week or two, longer. Um, so those can be pretty devastating. Uh, and they'll leave, um, they can lead to a fistulas if they're not repaired right away. So my birth story, I'm gonna go through this, I promise, really quick. So, um, so my first baby, I had a natural birth plan. My mom had super fast, easy births. That's what I was gonna have. Um, I was hospital with an OB. So my water broke the day after my due date. Labor didn't start. I was GBS positive. So you know how that goes. Um, I had to be given Pitocin. And I luckily progressed really fast. Um, but then I started pushing. And I pushed and pushed. They were doing coach pushing, even though I didn't have an epidural and I could feel all my urges. And it just, the pushing didn't feel right the way they were coaching me. So three and a half hours later, I was exhausted. The OB offered, do you want a C-section or a vacuum? I chose the vacuum. Um, she did also do an episiotomy, which a lot of times they do go hand in hand. You do both. But she never said anything to me that she was doing the episiotomy, just the vacuum. So that was rough. Um, finding out during my second pregnancy that I had an episiotomy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so emotionally, after my first birth, I feel like I did pretty well, considering. Um, I had a really good support system. Um, I have, my mom is a labor and delivery nurse. She was with me for like two or three weeks after, so it was like I had a live-in nurse, which is awesome. Um, I have you know, a wonderful husband, in-laws, who literally live right down the road. So I know I'm lucky in that way that I had a really good support system, so I'm sure that's why I did emotionally well. Um, I focused on the positives. I am one of the lucky ones that I had a really good OB. Um, she was experienced. She recognized my tear right away. I had a, a great repair physically. Um, I healed really well compared to a lot of other people. Um, but it still took me nine months to feel normal. But that's I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, I also obsessed over my next birth. I was going to have that redemptive birth that everybody talks about. I was already researching home birth midwives. I was getting out of the hospital. Um, so it was kind of obsessive the way I was. Um, so that means that my trauma was kind of delayed until after I did get my redemptive birth um, with my second son. But it was like I finally had something to compare 
um, that first experience to, because whenever your trauma happens with your first birth, um, you don't have anything to compare it to. You might know, yeah, that was bad, but you don't know, you know, how it could have been. So then after this amazing home water birth, um, I just realized, wow, that first one was awful. So I started looking into birth trauma, started looking for support groups. Um, there was nothing specific for severe tearing. There was one very tiny um, group on a baby center, but it wasn't active. You put something and not get a response for a while. So I decided to create the Facebook support group. That was January of 15, which means it was like four months after my second son was born. It's a, um, it's a closed group, so only the people in the group um, see the posts. It is peer-to-peer. -peer. We've had um, other people, like other providers, um, request to join who want to either learn from our experiences or want to help in any way. Um, but as a group, we collectively have decided that we just want to keep it peer-to-peer. So over the first three years, we, uh, we grew slowly to 300 members, which that's still pretty good. Um, so last year, May 2018, if you've heard of Scary Mommy, yes. yeah, like an online blog, they have a Facebook group, millions of followers. They did an article about our group, included some of the stories, um, and that gave us a lot of exposure. So from May to September, we went from 300 and something members to 1,000, which was funny when she was reading my bio, <laughs> saying we almost reached 1,000, because now we have, we're like two people shy of 1,500 members. <laughs> um, so since September, we've continued to grow. Because if someone Googles fourth degree tear, like a brand new mom, it's one of the first links that comes up um, is the Scary Mommy article. So um, you all know this stuff. Some of the benefits of support groups but i just wanted to highlight a couple of them um feeling less alone that's what a lot of people say is that they feel like nobody else is talking about this i don't know anyone else who is going through this um, which they probably do but nobody talks about it um, being able to talk honestly about their feelings especially because it is an online group people can sometimes feel more comfortable talking about issues like bowel incontinence um, painful sex on the internet with strangers than they maybe are face-to-face. -face. Um, and then just learning from other people's experiences. Um, we have women whose hair uh, was 50 years ago to it happened today, like it happened this morning, people are joining. So, and then everyone in between. So you're able to learn, you know, what has helped people, what has hurt people. Um, so it's been amazing seeing that. These are just some quotes directly from our group. Um, one person said, I read the article on Scary Mommy and tears began streaming down my cheeks. I'm not alone. I knew there had to be more women like me. I thought I was the only one going through this. I'm so glad to know I'm not alone anymore. I've never met anyone else who had a fourth degree tear before, which again, it's probably not true. She probably just doesn't know it. Um, and you can see the other ones there. Uh, the bottom one there, I wish I knew this group I wish I knew of this group two years ago when my daughter was born. That's what a lot of people say is, oh my gosh, I'm however many months or years out and I wish I would have known about this earlier. So that's what's been really helpful with the, um, the Scary Mommy article. <coughs> so a lot of people suffer in silence and why? Um, one is just shame and embarrassment of the symptoms that you're dealing with. A lot of people don't like to talk about or hear about um, like bowel incontinence gas incontinence, things like that. Um, you feel isolated, maybe because of those issues, you're, you don't really go out anymore, you're, um, you're stuck at home a lot. Um, you don't return to work because of those issues. Um, just you're, a lot of times the, the situations regarding the birth itself, when you have these kinds of injuries can be traumatic they needed to get the baby out right away, so they did, you know, the episiotomy or forceps or whatever. So they're still in kind of this shock state, so they don't talk about it as much, maybe. Um, they're focusing on their physical issues more than their emotional ones. They have a baby to take care of. Um, a lot of time, first time moms are at a higher risk than um, other moms. So again, they don't really know what to expect anyway, so um, think maybe this is normal. Um, and again,
and the they switch providers um, so there's not kind of that continuity of care. So some common topics in the group, um, just discussion of all the symptoms and how healing's going, different procedures you've had, um, who are you seeing, are you doing physical therapy, what are you doing in physical therapy, just trying to figure out uh, what is normal. And there like is no normal. <laughs> um, everyone heals differently, um, but you can at least kind of find some common ground with people. Um, sexual problems, which I'll talk about later, future births I'll talk about later, um, fistulas, like I mentioned before, especially with like those buttonhole type tears, um, or even women who had a good repair, but maybe they get an infection, um, or just the repair breaks down for some reason, they can develop fistulas, um, even here in the U.S., even though fistulas are eradicated from the developed world, if you mm -hmm. try to research it, that's what they say, like all of the research in the U.S. is, they're eradicated. The fear of um, issues worsening over time. You know, we're 20, 30 years old dealing with these things. We go to a urogynecologist or a colorectal surgeon, and in the waiting room, everyone's like 80, 70, um, and we think, man, we're already dealing with these things, and what is our life going to be like in 20, 30, 40, 50 years? So, I really like to do group polls. It's kind of like I'm researching. Um, since we have all these women in one place. Um, and a lot of the research that's already out there looks at both third and fourth theory tears together. There's very little research that um, breaks the two apart. There is some out there. Um, so I wanted to kind of compare what our group goes through to what the research says. Um, so the first one is how many people um, felt like they had postpartum depression after their birth. So 40% denied, which means 60% said that they did. And you can see the different breakdowns of who was um, officially diagnosed and put on meds or not. And then 28% who were not diagnosed, they just answered and said, I feel like I was depressed, but I was never diagnosed with it. Um, and there was a uh, qualitative study that looked at how severe tearing um, affects women. And it said that the psychological impact, impact is extensive and complex. Uh, we feel vulnerable, exposed, and disempowered. We have to work to rediscover and redefine a new sense of self. Uh, and these are some really sad um, quotes that come directly from our group. Um, one person said, I laid in bed after my son was born, praying I would die in my sleep. I told myself I was ruined and that my husband wouldn't want me anymore. I told myself that my son would be better off without me. <sighs> Hopefully you guys can read some of these because I'm not reading them all out loud. The last one says, I'm tired of people looking, tell, sorry, tired of people telling me to look on the bright side because really, although I'm physically living, this has taken almost all joy from my life. And there is understandably um, a lot of focus right now on like our maternal uh, mortality rate. Um, but not only do we need our moms, you know, physically living, we need them like actually living, you know. Um, so then here's one for PTSD. And again, around the same amount said they did not, around 42%. Uh, so almost 60% said that they did feel like they had PTSD after their birth, but only 17% were actually diagnosed. Um, whether that 41% actually would have full-blown PTSD diagnosis, they at least felt traumatized enough that they answered yes to this poll. Uh, and that's compared to, you all know, around 9% of all births have PTSD. A couple of the risk factors for postpartum PTSD, um, a lot of this fall into, there's an obvious one, physical complications, including a third or fourth degree tear. Um, and then vacuum forceps birth is a risk factor, which a lot of us um, do have that. And some more quotes. Um, so postpartum depression hit me hard, along with anxiety and PTSD of the delivery. I lost all 50 pounds and then some within three weeks of giving birth. 
I sobbed any time I thought about her birth or any time I thought about the idea of doing that all again someday. My anxiety was so bad that I didn't want anyone to hold her. I didn't want anyone to come over. I didn't want to sleep because I thought something was going to happen to her while we slept. Um, and you can see someone had um, PTSD um, from sexual trauma in their past and then from the birth because, I mean, we know that childbirth in general can be a trigger of past um, sexual trauma, but then if you're thinking about that kind of injury down there also on top of that, um, that can be very traumatizing. So fecal incontinence, um, a lot of the research out there, the, um, the definition of fecal incontinence is pretty vague. So there's either from gas incontinence to maybe like bowel urgency, um, having to get to the bathroom quickly, to actual some leakage, to just full blown no control at all. So I wanted to, um, in this poll, make a very specific definition. So it was, you have enough um, leakage to soil your underwear. So as you can see, 30% said no, which means 70% have experienced it at least once. Um, since their birth. So, and then you can see it's broken down to how often um, it has happened. 5% have it daily, 23% it happens uh, more than once a month, 33% it happens less than once a month. So that's like maybe you get a stomach bug or you eat something that didn't sit well. Um, so it's not an often thing, but it still happens. I have a question. How yes. Long, how long after? Anytime after birth? It was anytime, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you can see 7% said they did have it for some time period, um, but then it did resolve whether that was, you know, just for time, for physical therapy, for surgery, um, something happened to help it resolve. And then 2% said they don't have fecal incontinence because they have like a colostomy bag or something like that. But if they didn't, they probably would have the incontinence. Um, and unfortunately, fecal incontinence is extremely underreported. Mm -hmm. Only 51% told anyone, like a friend or a spouse, um, someone close to them. And even less than that, 10 to 30% actually told their doctor about it. And this was, um, this was a, a study just on women in general who have fecal incontinence. So this isn't specific to like childbirth tearing. This could be like older women or anything. Um, but it was specific to women with fecal incontinence. Mm -hmm. And then there was um, a study that looked at bowel control following tearing, and it showed that 23% of the women in the third and fourth degree tear group experienced fecal incontinence. This was um, pretty short after birth, like several weeks or months, versus the control group had, it was 13.4, which, I mean, that's, a lot of women in the control group to be experiencing this. But again, is this, are you talking about gas incontinence? You know, that's pretty common. Or is this like full blown fecal incontinence? Um, and they did separate the two out between the third degree tears and the fourth degree tears. The third degree tear group said that they had um, worsened bowel control, which I mean, it seems really low. But, and the fourth degree tear group, um, was 30.8%. So you can see there's a big difference between the third and fourth degree tears there. Um, these pictures down at the bottom are pictures from women in our group who um, I asked them to share, like they carry around a diaper bag with them for themselves and to take the items out um, and show me what all they carry around with them. And you can see there's um, like diapers, like the Depends pads, um, spray, wipes, bags, change of, change of clothes. Um, one person said, I don't leave the house much anymore, but when I do, an adult diaper and wipes go with me. I plan for everything. I always wear something I can take off quickly. Depending on where I'm going, I might wear Depends. I always have wipes, diaper rash cream, a towel or chucks to sit on. I keep a roll of toilet paper in the car or even like kids potties mm -hmm. um, they keep in the car. Um, Kleenex in my purse, an extra outfit. Is anyone else tr 
uh, terrified to travel. My husband keeps talking about taking a vacation, but I keep panicking about losing control of my poop on an airplane or a taxi. I have issues with fecal incontinence and major anxiety about it. Um, it's, it is so uncomfortable and I always feel gross. Even five minutes after being out of the shower, I feel like I could shower 10 times a day. And even for women who don't maybe experience full blown, um, you know, loss of control, they can still like maybe after bowel movement, they just feel like they can never get clean enough, you know, without having to take a shower or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so then I did do a separate one for gas incontinence to separate the two out. Um, so as you can see, 11% said that they never experienced any gas incontinence, but that means almost 90% did. Um, and 63% lasted for at least a year. Um, so fistulas that are eradicated. 72% um, denied having a fistula that they knew of, at least, which means 28% said that they did. So out of only 274 people answered, not the whole group, um, which that was 200 and something was about average that we had on all of the polls being answered. So that was like 70 something women who said that they did develop a fistula. 13% um, of them, they got repaired, which I think that's a, the big difference is that we at least have better access to care to get them repaired if we do develop them. 3% um, had a repair, but it didn't work. So they still have a fistula. Um, Five percent, it somehow healed itself, and then seven percent, it's still unrepaired. Um, some women are told that they need to wait until they're finished having children to get their fistula repaired, um, because if they have another baby, it can cause damage. Hey, we That's, have a C-section. Right. It's controversial. Um, some women do get repaired and then go on to have more kids and choose a C-section. I know of at least one woman who actually chose to have a vaginal birth and has zero tearing. So it's, it's, yeah. Um, so, I mean, they're dealing with like poop coming out of their vagina for years mm -hmm. until they're finished having their family. Mm -hmm. So it's really sad. Um, a, a um, oh, I need to look at my notes for this one. This was from a, um, This is a quote from an editorial in the Journal of International Gynecology and Obstetrics titled, Dead Women Walking. And it was about the women in Africa who have um, obstetric fistulas. It says um, they are considered the most debilitating and devastating of maternal morbidities. Once her fistula is established, her life is changed forever as she is no longer able to fulfill her societal roles of wife and mother and is often deserted by her husband and stigmatized by society. So, I mean, it's devastating for us here, you know, in the, the developed world, but I know in, like this was in Africa, and I, I hate to compare our experiences because, I mean, those women, not only are they dealing with it, but they're probably not getting repaired at all. Um, they probably, they don't have like access like we do to, at least to um, like sanitary, sanitation to at least clean ourselves after. Um, so this is a group poll of when did you attempt sex for the first time after your tear? Um, you can see a good amount were, <laughs> right? <laughs> At all. Um, the majority are between the six weeks and six months range, which is probably pretty normal. Um, but 35% waited at least six months before they tried for the first time. Um, and that is compared to a study that looked at this that com combined both the third and fourth degree tears and 13.6% of them waited at least six months. Um, that qualitative um, study that was looking at this showed um, that severe tearing altered the women's identity as sexual beings. They feel broken, dirty, um, you have either decreased sensation, like you're unable to orgasm for whatever, um, whatever the cause of that might be, or uh, it's severely painful, um, or you have the fear of fecal incontinence or gas incontinence 
happening um, while you're doing that. So there can be a lot of barriers. So that was when did you try for the first time. This one is how long was it painful once you did try? Um, the majority there between six months and a year, which I personally believe that's probably hormonal, um, maybe. Um, I know I noticed that with myself, um, that I think with the breastfeeding tied to it and the hormonal change, changes that happen. Um, but again, you can see a very large amount there. Um, it was still painful and it had been at least a year. And then some in there, the two to five years, five to 10 years, 10 years plus. Um, so a study that looked at this said that um, comparing second degree tears to like women who did not tear, they're 80% more likely to have painful sex. And women who had third and fourth degree tears were 270% more likely uh, to have painful sex than those who did not tear. This is one of the uh, most talked about things in our group is what do I do with my next child? Um, do I have a C-section? Do I attempt a vaginal birth? I mean, it is almost daily women are asking, you know, what do they do? Um, so as you can see, 54% chose, and this is for women who now have already had um, future children. What did they decide and what was the result? 54% um, chose a C-section. Um, and so the side on the left there are all the women who have vaginal births. 6% um, had a completely intact perineum. 4% had a first degree. Uh, the majority there had a second degree at 22%, and then 7% each for third and fourth degree tears. Um, if you just look at the vaginal births and you take out all the C-sections, then 29% of them had the OA side, that's again, or OAC, I don't know. Um, it's a term they're really using in the UK for obstetric anal sphincter injury. Um, so 29% had another third or fourth degree tear, so their anal sphincters were injured again. Which having one is bad enough, but having another, that can be um, really devastating. And so another 30 uh, people answered that I'm not having any more kids, whether that's only because of their tearing, they chose that, or just, it just happened that way that they were done having kids. Um, so there are a lot of aspects to the decision. Um, it's not just a physical decision, it's an emotional one. Um, for the physical side of things, fecal incontinence is uh, a big factor of whether or not you're a good candidate for a vaginal birth. If you do have fecal incontinence, then they recommend that you do not try for another vaginal birth. Um, but no two women are the same. Um, let's say two women have fecal incontinence. One woman says, yeah, I'm not having another vaginal birth because I don't want that to get worse. Another woman says, I already have it. <laughs> like, <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> <know. laughs> do I go through the trauma of a C-section now, you know, an abdominal trauma when I already, you know, messed up in there. Do I have two places now, you know, kind of with a weak link? So they choose to have um, another vaginal birth. Um, or on the flip side of things, two women who do not experience any fecal incontinence at all. One woman might say, okay, great, I'm a good candidate for a vaginal birth, so that's what I'm going to do. The other one says, I lucked out once. I'm not pushing my luck and trying again. <laughs> um, so no way I'm having a C-section. So yes, the physical aspect is important, but it's not the only um, the only aspect. So providers should not be saying in either direction to a woman, oh, you had a fourth degree tear or a third degree tear, um, then you should definitely, whatever, have a C-section or your risk is lower, so you should definitely you know, try for a vaginal birth. Um, and even if you do, plan a scheduled C-section, have a birth plan for what do I do if labor starts before. Because it happens and then the woman is completely terrified and um, just didn't even think it was possible to at least talk about it so that if it happens, she's not like completely blindsided. Um, 
So kind of comparing the two emotional um, sides of it, one person said, I have nightmares about going into labor and not being able to get my C-section. I could never have another vaginal birth. It would be too traumatizing for me. And then someone else said, uh, before I even got pregnant a second time, I was researching home births. A C-section never crossed my mind. Emotionally, I needed a redo. I needed to have another vaginal birth. Um, so this is the poll I was talking about, about switching providers, um, almost 70% switch, whether that is because they place some sort of blame on the provider for their care, um, or they just don't trust them, so they switch, or whether they don't put any blame at all on the provider, it was not, you know, their fault at all, but they still trigger, you know, that trauma and that PTSD, just going back to see them, so they want to go see somewhere else someone else or they make a change in their birth plan like I switched from an OB because I wanted to have um, a home birth with a midwife or on the flip side someone who maybe did have a midwife um, not necessarily as a home birth but now they want to schedule c-section so they might switch to an OB so it goes both ways so how can you help um, for the people who are like the birth workers, um, immediate proper diagnosis and repair is vital um, for long-term complications. There was a small study, I think there were only 200 and something women in the study in the UK. So you know UK midwives, um, the midwifery system is different than it is here. Um, so that's what they were looking at is how many of them missed, again the OASI or third and fourth degree tears. How many of them missed them. So like under diagnosed them, diagnosed them as only like secondary tear maybe. 87% of them were missed by midwives. And 28%, I mean the doctors did better, but still they missed 28%. That's, that's a lot. Um, so aggressively diagnosing, like if you think, eh, this might be a third degree tear, but eh, I'm just going to call it a second. Like, that can, uh, that can cause problems down the road. Um, prevention, obviously, is huge. Preventing this from happening in the first place. Um, and Katie will be talking about that um, in more detail. Being asked specific questions from our healthcare providers. We don't like talking about this stuff, and we're not going to tell you unless you ask. So instead of saying, oh, how are you doing? Do you have any problems? Ask, are you having any pain with sex? Are you having any fecal incontinence? Are you having any, you know, gas incontinence? Very specific questions so that we have to answer you, that we can't just say, oh yeah, everything's fine. Um, a, give us a balance of information um, at the right time. It's amazing how many women do not know what degree they tore. They have no idea. They were not told. Um, I have to like, some questions and kind of figure out, well, what are your symptoms now? Like, they're just not told this stuff and it's just mind blowing. Um, so you need to tell them, if that's your thing, uh, what degree they told, they tore. And, but also be careful with the timing. They don't need to be given a whole bunch of information like immediately after they push a baby out and like you're sewing them up. That's not when you should say things like, you're gonna need to have a C-section for your next that's not the right time. Um, so we need information, but maybe just wait uh, at least a couple hours. Um, provide resources for them. Um, man, I had a handout, but I didn't actually give out any handouts. Did I? It's online through, I think, some link in this. Um, of different online support groups, there are two uh, Facebook support groups. I run the one for four theory tears. There's another one for like severe tearing in general. So people who had a really bad second degree tear that just took a long time to heal, the third degree tears, it's called birth tear support. Um, uh, and I know, what's that? Also Facebook. Yes, it is, yep. Um, and I know you guys are awesome around here for having like local groups, which is amazing. I wish everyone had that. Um, refer to specialists, um, urogynecologists, colorectal surgeons, and we need to see specialists, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, refer to physical therapy, 
which Katie is going to talk to you about in just a minute, and then screen more closely because we're at a higher risk for um, the mood disorders, so for the PTSD, for the depression. And I'm going to pass that over to Katie. 